Good morning and welcome to Anthropology 4310, uh, uh, Theories of Culture. Uh, we're now involved, as most of you know, in a series of presentations by students. Our first group today is not quite in the <laughs> classroom yet, so we're going to be waiting for them. Meanwhile, I thought I could start the set of remarks I was going to make about uh, cultural ecology, especially about the contributions made by Julian Stewart. Um, in a more formal lecture style. Uh, again, for those of you who are not aware of it, uh, Professor Stewart was one of my own professors. Uh, and in fact, one of those people that attracted me into anthropology. And uh, in terms of where he was leading anthropology, I think he, he was one of those people that Broad anthropology from cultural relativism, from the, the more humanistic side of the theoretical pole or continuum towards um, uh, cultural materialism. Uh, he was heavily and greatly influenced by positivism, and that was the mode of thinking in anthropology in his time. Uh, most people aren't aware of this, but he was originally an archaeologist. He started off with archaeological studies and uh, gradually um, drew or became interested in the studies of the Shoshone Indians of uh, the United States as well as some other groups. And through that um, early work, became more interested in much larger theories, much larger concerns, which indeed uh, redirected, I think, an entire field of anthropology. Uh, before, I have told you that there's a kind of pedigree in anthropology, that if we go back to Boaz, as um, in a kind of sexist vein, and I apologize for that being called the father of American anthropology, maybe we could call him the parent <laughs> of American anthropology, but somehow that doesn't have the same kind of uh, uh, intellectual content. And to realize that he was the uh, major teacher for an anthropologist by the name of Alfred Kroeber, that's K-R-O-E-B-E-R, -E -E and then in turn, uh, Stewart was probably the student of Kroeber's that made uh, the greatest degree of contribution to anthropological thought and discussion. Um, and, and the way I see that continuum or that pedigree there is that it eventually became a much more defined statement or refined statement about cause and effect in culture change. And when you're at Boaz's level, no discussion of cause and effect. By the time you get to Stewart, it, the word was actually introduced into some of his writings. But it's a very special concept of cause. It's not one that is exactly meant when you usually think of physics or chemistry, uh, either inorganic or organic, or some of the more natural sciences. And we will probably have occasion to revisit that concept a little later in the class, possibly depending on when these students present themselves, either before or after their presentation. Uh, we're talking about cultural materialism. And there were several people, several individuals, who felt that the relativists were misdirecting anthropology, that they weren't, couldn't truly lay claim to this label of being a scientific method and a scientific theory in terms of cultural relativity. And they wanted to, again, return to earlier notions in anthropology, earlier questions in anthropology. And one of those earlier notions and questions, of course, was this whole set of concerns around cultural evolution. Um, if you remember, Boaz and the American School rejected um, the 19th century classical evolutionists because they felt that their nomothetic scheme was way too simplistic uh, and was false and misleading in terms of its contribution. Nomothetic is a word that means big theory, 
explaining multiple conditions and sets of conditions, and as opposed to more s tightly contained or narrowly confined or conceptualized uh, concerns. Uh, nomothetics is what uh, is thought to be the study of large scale culture change, which another word for that, of course, is cultural evolution. And the, if you remember, the relativists rejected uh, the 19th century anthropologists because they thought their scheme of uh, cultural evolution was too um, ambitious. It explained too many um, variables, too many sets of phenomena, meaning various cultures, into uh, monolithic a scheme. And in doing that, uh, they kind of threw out the baby with the bathwater, according to Stewart and his students. In other words, they thought, thought that evolution was an appropriate concern of anthropology, and that anthropology should consider this large-scale um, set of conditions leading to culture change. Uh, the way in which there would be a principal distinction between, say, the cultural evolution of Stewart and the cultural evolution of these classical uh, 19th century evolutionists would be that he would call his theory one of multilinearity, whereas their theory was known as a unilinear scheme or approach to the study of cultural evolution. And what that means simply is that there is not one scheme or line of development that can be traced by culture change or in culture change, but rather uh, clinging to those notions of, of Boaz, uh, of historical particularism. And I'll put this over where you can see it in a minute. Uh, of historical particularism, that there was not, if you remember, uh, one uh, uh, history, universal history of humanity or mankind, but rather there were as many histories uh, of human societies as there were human societies. So it became a kind of a historical pluralism or pluralism histories of history. Uh, Krober added to this discussion uh, by talking about, um, oh, I would say trends or fashions. He thought that we should be returning to a notion of, of large-scale culture change, and there, there seemed to be inherent in society and human culture itself a kind of a natural unfolding of events, a kind of, um, if you will, um, things happened the way they were supposed to happen. Uh, society didn't unravel, rather, and society progressed along ways in which... Uh, <sighs> they were set in motion. It's kind of uh, not teleologically, but but uh, efficient cause. And in terms of that, in his case, Krober would talk about cultural evolution. He would even talk about, for example, if he were describing uh, the contributions of archaeology, he would talk about how various cultures, individual cultures, would have regional uh, contributions to make and as time passed and they became more elaborate and they, and they changed and they became part of a much uh, larger configuration of cultural elements that they moved from simple organized societies, say hunters and gatherers, as they came under the impact of agricultural technology, they in turn would become uh, changed or transformed by that uh, technological innovation. And as time passed, they would then make their own contributions to that kind of elaboration. So um, uh, Krober's and Boaz's uh, theoretical conceptualizations, if you like, had the germs of the ideas that Stewart later developed. These are not apart from, these are not seen as outside of uh, general anthropological thought. It's really the emphasis given to them, or the importance given to them, by the writings of Julian Stewart. Um, Stewart was, a, I'll talk about the man for a moment, and then we'll get back to more of his theoretical uh, conceptualizations. Stewart was a, a, a fairly um, accessible person. He was not uh, distant or remote. 
Uh, he taught mostly or only graduate students. Uh, he taught no undergraduate courses. Uh, when I knew him anyway, and, and in, at the t entire period of time that he was at the University of Illinois, he only taught one course each year, and that was his theory of culture change, which is what his book published in 1955 was entitled, and which uh, was primarily contained most of his major ideas and essays, and he brought them together in one volume and laid out then a methodology of culture change and presented that for uh, his students to study. And then we would spend the semester uh, taking his ideas and applying them to areas of the world in which each of us as students were particularly interested. Um, he had this large cross-cultural approach to things. He, um, as I say, he was extremely accessible to students. Students could come in and talk to him, in which they frequently sought to do. The game during the semester became, became to catch him. <laughs> he lived in Fithian, Illinois, which was uh, maybe 20 miles down the road from uh, Champaign-Urbana, which was in the middle of a large cornfield. Uh, and, but, you know, he decided that he didn't want to live in, in the <laughs> ur urban experience of Champaign-Urbana, which is, even today, I think the population is about maybe 250,000 uh, in the Twin Cities. And that was too urban for him. That was too uh, modern, too complicated, too complex. So he moved to Fithian, which was a very small, probably less than a few hundred um, people uh, in the rural environs of Champaign-Urbana. Uh, and he lived there with his wife. He had two children, two sons, uh, neither of whom uh, followed in his footsteps. Um, uh, his wife was devoted to him and his career. Uh, I have a book uh, that I was going to uh, present some information from later on. Uh, that is edited by his wife, Jane Stewart, and he, probably one of his foremost students, Robert Murphy. It's called Evolution and Ecology. I don't know if you can see it or not. I'll put it up there. Uh, uh, and it was published, I believe, in 19, early 70s, uh, which was also uh, corresponded with uh, right after his death. Um, and usually the, the, the tradition in anthropology and other sciences or social sciences was on the death of a great scholar or a great uh, person who made great contributions that you have a fast shrift or you have a collection of articles that you bring together that are written by students and c colleagues that kind of uh, essentialize in some ways those ideas that he, he uh, contributed and the impact that he had on individuals lives. Sometimes those uh, essays or collections of essays were conceptualized before the professor was uh, gone, <laughs> passed beyond, or however you want to describe it. And in, in Dr. Stewart's case, uh, they had a large um, a cocktail party and dinner uh, while he was still alive, and um, uh, anthropologists came to this uh, agricultural uh, isolated <laughs> community um, in the mid in the Midwest uh, to honor him, and there were anthropologists from all over the world, from New York, from from all parts of the United States as well, from all the major uh, universities that came together in Champaign-Urbana uh, to have this uh, feshrift, or this at least celebration of it, uh, forecoming uh, feshrift. And I had the honor of being the um, cocktail person. I made the cocktails. Uh, for this party and served all these famous people and would get their drinks uh, confused and <laughs> mistakenly ordered and what have you because when they would tell me who they were I would just you know kind of <laughs> back off in ca amazement and then forget entirely the order but of course I couldn't admit that I just go ahead and prepare a drink and give it to them and I must say drink they did <laughs> uh, whatever we made for them but uh, he was a very friendly man and I, and I remember he is, he is kind of a paternalistic figure. He's maybe one of the last figures that I consider in anthropology at least to have that kind of paternalism. But socially, like many great thinkers and many great anthropologists, he was uncomfortable. He was really socially ill at ease with people. And I remember at that party even that uh, he stayed in the kitchen 
with those of us who were making the drinks and all of his students and colleagues, the great names of anthropology out there, were in the other room, other rooms of this house, and he was paying them little attention. And I think it was because he was uncomfortable. He was uncomfortable at the attention he was receiving, and he was uncomfortable with, the, uh, with being in their presence. And that partly has to, to, I think, to do with why he lived in Fithian, as opposed to Champaign-Urbana as well. He uh, didn't know what to do with all the acclaim he had received. Uh, but he was a man uh, around whom students felt comfortable. Uh, they felt uh, informed by taking his seminars, which was a two-semester graduate seminar. And they uh, came from, as I say, they came from all over the world to study under this uh, gentleman. Um, I think it's, it would be important or useful now for us to think about what were some of the more, um, what, was the, what were the contributions that he made intellectually? What was his form of materialism? What is it that he uh, set to redirect anthropology? Um, he didn't really have a, an extreme negative reaction to cultural relativism nor to psychological anthropology, as many of his own contemporaries had. A lot of anthropologists at the time of Franz Boas and Albert Krober, or Alfred Krober, excuse me, uh, really put down this whole area, separate area known as psychological anthropology. They thought it was reductionist in argument, and they thought that it was unacceptable as having such a large claim on anthropological discussion as it did in the 50s and 60s. Um, and Stewart didn't really reject it. He just placed it in a different position vis-a-vis -vis other subject materials in anthropolo anthropological discussion. So in a way, uh, he retained whatever insights cultural relativism had to offer us as anthropologists. But yet he added to it these notions of ecology or environment. He added to it the influence and importance of the variable of technology. And he was able to take these two notions, these sets of conditions surrounding technology and surrounding the environment, and talk it then about a multilinear scheme of cultural development and change. Um, one of his tightest arguments in this area had to do with uh, irrigation civilizations. And I think it, it kind of gives you a notion of his way of thinking. Uh, irrigation civilizations were those civilizations that early on in their agricultural development required um, moisture or water in order to be successful. In other words, these occurred in those areas of the world that uh, experienced uh, periods of great drought or experienced a lack of moisture in terms of their natural environment. And in these uh, civilizations, or in these cultures rather, uh, it required them in order to become the groups that they became, in order to become the civilizations that they became, it required them then to deal with this overriding problem of how to deliver water to their crops. And in doing that, it brought about one of the most tightly um, organized societies uh, that the world has ever known, even to the point of being called um, despots or despotic cultures. And they had to be despotic in the sense that this was such a mammoth or large-scale work that uh, Stuart uh, felt that, that this required them to organize or marshal labor in that society, M-A-R-T-I-A-L, uh, such that they were able to build these large-scale uh, structures that were uh, intended to bring water to uh, these various crops. And in turn, the kind of organization that was required, the social organization, was so tightly constructed that uh, they had to be despotic in nature. 
In other words, these were not democracies. These were not anything like the world is probably witnessing today. Uh, this would go back to, say, the kind of images, images that might come to your mind when you think of the pyramids and the uh, Hebrew peoples uh, uh, trying to escape from Egypt uh, back to the land of milk and honey uh, in terms of the Egyptians' uh, control over them and their labor. Not only bring them up as a comparative group, as a model by means of which to give you some insight into the kinds of groupings that uh, Stuart had in mind. So in these irrigation civilizations then, in these cultures that required mammoth works of um, transporting water over great distances to uh, arid areas where crops were fragile at best, and they were successful in doing this by becoming despotic in terms of their organization. So then you have this notion of here's the environment, a fairly arid environment, in which you have a certain kind of technology involved, irrigation, which in turn allows them to become a much more complex society and civilization than they were previously. Uh, my group seems to be disappearing. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Because <laughs> uh, I'm running out of things to say at this moment anyway. At least I thought we were ending here, so I was getting ready to wind up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, you have this arid environment, you have this uh, irrigation technology, and you have then an elaboration of a, of a group of people going to a much less organized group of people to a cultural grouping that was much more broadly organized, that was much more um, tightly organized in a much more complicated way. In, in other words, when, when Stewart was talking about going from simple to complex, from regional to national, or national in earlier terms. He was thinking in terms of the areas over which a particular society exerted control. And that's why in many of his writings you'll hear phrases such as levels of sociocultural complexity. You go from a simple level of cultural, sociocultural complexity, say such as a hunting and gathering ban, to a very complex and broader level of sociocultural complexity, such as one might find in irrigation civilization. Um, you know, we marvel at these things when we look back on them now in terms of the degree to which they were seemingly such a, a tightly organized society, a, a society and culture in which there seemed to be a great deal of organization, uh, great military forces were established and empires were built. Uh, but if you think about it, that's what was required. You know, if you look at, uh, for example, another area uh, around which, uh, other than irrigation civilizations, would be the Inca Empire as it was uh, encountered at the time of contact. That was a stretch of land that went from Colombia, vaguely, <laughs> to through uh, uh, Ecuador, Bolivia, Peru, and Chile. And that's about a 2,000-mile stretch of land. But if you notice, if you've ever seen the maps, you know that uh, it was a very narrow. <laughs> if you look at Chile today, it seems very narrow in terms of the area covered, in terms of its uh, length as opposed to breadth. And it would be very difficult to marshal forces that would require some kind of authoritarian rule. You know, if you have a 2,000-mile stretch of land and the most you have is agricultural technology and you're trying to build an empire, I don't know if anybody ever sat down and said, today I will build an empire, but you know, as, as things again unfolded in this larger-than-life picture, uh, you know, it required society to be greatly organized, for forces to be um, kind of despotically uh, or authoritarian rule to be imposed on them. It isn't something that, that gave rise to easy living. <laughs> uh, I think if I were to choose a form of life myself uh, from one of these earlier chapters in human history, I would have preferred to have been a member of a uh, simple hunting and gathering band, except I don't hunt very well. <laughs> so I guess I would have had to have gathered. I don't know. Uh, but uh, I also would not do well in one of these irrigation civilizations or one of these more authoritarianly organized uh, groups, groupings of individuals. Um, all right, these are meant then as a kind of an introductory set of remarks. I don't know if our group is ready or not. Are they ready? One more? <laughs> okay, I hope it's soon. Uh, um, 
But I, I suppose I'll, what I'll do is I'll start talking about um, his theory of cultural ecology, uh, which is probably his greatest contribution. I was hoping to do this after the groups had uh, finished, um, you know, reporting or doing their presentations um, on this topic, but we must do with what we have in front of us. And so, cultural ecology is probably the theoretical contribution that Julian Stewart made, which has had the greatest impact on anthropological thinking and discussion. It remains important to the very present. Uh, it doesn't get all of the uh, more popular press. Uh, it refers to, I think, the more kind of standard kinds of anthropology that are done in archaeology and even biological anthropology um, that are just uh, there. Uh, time has uh, seemingly not impacted them as greatly as more recent uh, postmodern and post-structural changes in theoretical disposition as Dr. Rasmussen was talking about last week. But cultural ecology is something, in other words, that has staying power, that has been with us now for some time, and uh, has made an impact upon the way in which anthropology as a discipline is regarded and is viewed. It is, again, the materialistic side of the continuum. It is that set of concerns and anthropological notions that um, anthropologists like to identify with or associate with themselves when they're trying to uh, define themselves as scientists, either social or natural. And in so doing, they uh, make a contribution to this discussion between uh, humanities and uh, materialists in developing theoretical notions. The way I view cultural ecology uh, in a very simplistic way, if I were going to talk about a, a simple hunting and gathering ban, I would be talking about a group of people that might number at the most 200 and at least 50. And in those terms, and we're talking about a low-level organization, we're talking about an extended family, if you will. Uh, at least that's the way I view it. Whenever I go to one of my own uh, family reunions, and sometimes there are as many as 200 people there, I think of that it would be somewhat similar to a hunting and gathering a patrilineal band type society in which uh, those men who were the oldest and still able to uh, function well in terms of directing organized uh, uh, pursuit of game animals would be those in charge and possibly uh, the organization of that society and culture then would come about through kinship relations. In other words, there would be a kinship basis to that form of uh, social organization. So whom you were the parents of would be extremely important in that context. All right, those bands, those hunting and gathering bands, lived in particular kinds of environments. So some kinds of environments, thinking and speaking of the natural environments, would be more conducive to this kind of organization than would others. Uh, in other words, if your game animal is a large animal that migrated uh, from one place to another, then obviously what the human groups that would be required to do that pursued those game animals is they too would have to be organized in such a way as to follow the migration patterns of the animals uh, which they were pursuing. And that is an important concern that Stewart had. He not only talked about um, the ecology of an area, and if I misspelled that, no. <laughs> or And the um, social organization that was involved. He would also look importantly at the settlement pattern to give him clues. Generally speaking, uh, uh, individuals would group themselves according to the kinds of natural resources that were available. Be these game animals or be these... Um, plant materials. And the organization that would result would be in response to those natural dis distribution of resources. In terms then of looking at ecology as the uh, larger set of concerns and technology as being an important uh, tool used by groups of humans in working that environment, you would then see that there would be a resulting 
social organization or a settlement pattern that would just kind of naturally respond to that. And uh, uh, this in turn would give Stewart this kind of notion of culture change then. Uh, being a form of culture change that would require or would entertain uh, notions of cause and effect. Cause and effect in this sense means that the possible variations would be limited. It isn't that A plus B equals C as we might find in some kind of chemical equation, but rather given environment, uh, say, um, having some kind of berry or nut involved, uh, which would be a staple crop then of that group, uh, that maybe females of that society would, would gather, and possibly they would have uh, small uh, scale animal or small animals uh, that they would utilize or um, exploit in the environment. The, and the men then would become involved with uh, hunting. The females would become involved with gathering. And again, depending on the particular distribution of those resources, both the game animals and the plant materials, certain kinds of social organization would come into being, such as a patrilineal hunting ban, and certain kinds of settlement patterns would be developing in response to those larger sets of concerns. So in those terms, then, there was a limit on the variation that could occur. That's what I would say is the uh, meaning of culture, uh, cause and effect, in Stewart's uh, frame and theoretical developments. Okay, I understand our group is ready, so we're going to have a uh, short break. You're not to leave <laughs> while they get set up, and then we'll go on with the student presentation, and then and, and I will come back at the end of the class or the hour and spend whatever time we have left continuing my remarks, hopefully a little more organized, <laughs> on cultural ecology and the contributions of Julian Stewart. Thank you very much, and now we'll have the
we're on our way to seminar. Most of it's going on here, but then we get out and we come up to the podium and we each give a little mini lecture. Okay. So we're go we'll be going from here to here. Okay. Should we, we can lower this down to here and move the chairs forward and then you could get more into the car that way. Okay. All right. All right. Okay, got that chair. Oh, it was falling off, sorry. Okay, that needs to move. This away? Yeah. Okay. Do what now? Oh, when I'm putting the wheel back on. Come up in front of it a little, yeah. little bit like that, even yeah, if it doesn't make sense. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. Now, let's see. Just got to have leg room. Okay. You right there. How's that for the chairs? And then you're going to be right in the middle. You need something to sit on to raise you up a little. Does anybody have a big fat book? Hi, yes, we're group number three, Cultural Equality, and we have passed out a map for you to follow along with us on our little trip. There's the Langweb University of Cultural Anthropology entrance. Take a right, right here. We're on Boaz Boulevard. Turn right because I want to go to the Historical Particularism Building. That's where Boaz taught for a while. I taught there too, but... Um, I found it intellectually unsatisfying, so went on to the Cultural Evolution Building. I taught there too. I spent years researching the relationship between several different cultures, technologies, and their environments. Oh, really? I was there in 37. I initiated the Cross-Cultural Survey Project, which is now known as the Human Relations Area Files. That's where the files are stored in that building. HRAF now has information on 360 societies. Oh look, there's Functionalism Hall over there. Um, I think Molinowski taught there for a while. He taught several of the same ideas I did. Um, my evolutionary theory is a functionalist conception of culture, but he ultimately saw culture as functioning to meet individual needs, but I think that culture meets the needs of like the whole species in general. Um, by culture we mean an extrasomatic temporal continuum of things and events dependent upon symboling. You know, culture is not genetically transmitted. I don't know if you knew that. It's a learned behavior. Well, I believe that societies remain in relative equilibrium because they are social adap adaptations to environmental and economic factors. Murdoch, your little theory is amusing, but it's hardly sufficient. You underestimate the importance of how behavior patterns entailed in exploiting the environment greatly affect every aspect of the culture. For example, in a hunting and gathering culture, the amount of food hunted depends on the number of bodies available to do the hunting, the amount of time available to hunt, and how the hunting operation is to be carried out in the first place, and how the food is distributed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Stuart, you are a self-absorbed, undereducated pea brain. 
You would have a difficult time finding an anthropologist who has not made similar cross-cultural comparisons and conclusions, no matter what his dogma is. Really? Yes. At least my conclusions stand up reasonably well. Lots of anthropologists conduct cross-cultural research. Okay, okay, shut up, you old fart. I think we need to get to the seminar. We're going to be late. You might need to, I think you need to take a left on Culture Core Circle. Okay. Hey, did you hear? They put up a statue of Boaz by the fountain over there. It's not a statue of Boaz. It's a statue of Michelangelo's David with Boaz's head on it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a rule that you have to be dead before they put up a statue of you. I think they'll have statues of us someday. Maybe sooner than you think with her driving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Okay, we're on Culture Course Circle. Hey, there's White Hall. <laughs> I have a building named after me. Well, I have a building named after me, too. Well, in my building, each floor is named after each system of culture. The first floor is technological studies. The second floor is sociological studies. And the third floor is ideological studies. Well, in my building, um, it's the Murdochian Towers, and it is the Behavioral Sciences Building, and it includes the Psychology, Ethology, uh, Anthropology, and Sociology departments. Because of me, they are all part of a single discipline, and my work helped develop the theoretical approach that united them, and so put them all in one building at this university in honor of me. So there. Okay, okay. Hey, look, we're passing the football field. Oh, There's a game wow. going on. It's homecoming. Oh, yeah. We're playing the Bushmen, the hunting and gathering <laughs> culture of the Kalahari. <laughs> oh, look at the trumpets and the drums. It's the patrilineal band playing. <laughs> oh, to be young and energetic again. <laughs> was what you said about societies and what was, uh, what was it that you said about ex societies and experiment, sexual experimentation? Oh, that was whenever you're young and unmarried. Those societies that I studied permitted uh, pretty fit free sexual experimentation, but once they got married, uh, sowing their oats was over with. Um, you know that only 2% of societies condone that free behavior then. Uh, if such behavior were allowed to go on, then jealousy and discord would be generated by that infidelity. It's nearly universal that there are pro uh, prohibitions against adultery. Okay. Hey, Stuart, watch the road. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I think we had a flat tire! I told her, I told you that she would kill us all. <laughs> you still seem to be in one piece to me. Your legs seem fully functional. You know you may very well walk if you please. Let's just get out and change the tire, sir. We're going to be late. <clears throat> Where's the jacket, Emily? It's your car. <sighs> I think we need to hurry up. Hurry up, we're going to be late. Oh, how do you put this thing together? What is this? Did you borrow one of the Bushman's tools? <laughs> Murdoch, don't be such an intellectual snob. If you, feel like, if you don't feel like walking, fix it yourself. Well, I guess if I want something done right, I'll just have to do it myself. I guess you will. You need any help down there? <laughs> no. I'll just supervise over here. <sighs> Guys, I'm famished. What I wouldn't do for a Marxist burger. Isn't uh, the LWU underground around here somewhere? I think so. Um, I didn't know you liked those two. No. I love those. Marxist bur burgers are like my favorite thing to eat. But I don't usually like to tell people that. Um, I don't know. People think that they're bad for you or something. They inspire me, though. You know, I don't know if you knew this, but I think there's three factors to be considered in any cultural situation. Oh, really? One, the amount of energy per capita per unit of time harnessed and put to work within the culture. Two, the technolo technological means with which this energy is expended, like that piece of jack right there the human needs serving product that accrues from the expenditure of energy and I've come up with a little equation and it can be expressed as E times T equals P and say E represents the amount of energy expended per capita per unit of time 
T represents the technological means of expenditure, and P is the magnitude of the product per unit of time. Okay, say, like, you take this situation right here. You're changing a tire. Um, the amount of energy that you use per inch per minute times the quality of the car jack, which is, doesn't look very good to me, and that equals how many inches you've raised it. You get it? I get it. Okay, I think I'm done. If we don't hurry up, we're going to be late. Oh, look, I think that's Boaz Boulevard right there again. I think the seminar's in the Cultural Ecology Auditorium down that way. Yeah, that way. Okay, then, let's hurry. Okay, here we are. Are y'all ready to give your lectures? Sure. sure. Ready. Okay. Hi, how are you today? I'm George Peter Murdoch. Like White and Stewart, my colleagues, who you'll be hearing from shortly, I believe that social structure was created by forces external to social organization, principally uh, economic factors. In anthropology, I have uh, been best known for my studies of social structure and for my quantitative cross-cultural cross approaches. I am one of the first authors to use statistical analysis of ethnographic uh, data and random sampling. I further developed the comparative method which was previously outlined by Tyler in 1889. Because I pioneered the development of cross-cultural quantitative analysis in anthropology, I was considered by many to be a principal force behind the emergency of scientific cultural analyses. The benefit my form of research to my form of research is the ability to rapidly retrieve and correlate large amounts of cross-cultural data. Um, there have been many criticisms of my methods, some were well-founded, uh, such as not naming my references for some of my data. I forgot while I was buried under tons of information from all those cultures. I can only do so much, it happens, you know? And treating my data as uniform and comparable, even though the societies in my samples were uh, diverse, both geographically and temporally. Still, all in all, my conclusions stand up reasonably well. I feel pretty good. I feel like I did a pretty good job anyway. Um, I must have done something right. Divorce is common in societies around the world, and societies do have mechanisms to slow down or prevent divorce. And while many anthropologists reacted against my methods, there's an equal number that do conduct cross-cultural research even today. I'm very proud that the HRAF remains popular and is a valuable tool of research. You can check it out for yourselves in the Historical Particularism Building. Well, that's enough about me. Let's hear from a renowned colleague of mine, Leslie White. Hello, everyone. Uh, I've spent about 40 years developing one of the best anthropology departments in the United States at the University of Michigan. My lectures emphasize cultural determinism as opposed to free will or deism, uh, which is the beginning lead to attacks from irate parents. The C Catholic Church lobbied state legislatures against me and tried to get me dismissed from the university. But my lectures were well attended and my articles were extensively reprinted, I must say. Um, at that time, my evolutionary theories were at odds with most anthropological thinking. I wasn't a popular person. I advocated a general science of culture, not culture S, but of culture, which I called culturology. Between my theory of cultural evolution and my science of culture, which uh, was a two-pronged attack against historical particularism, I was not well received by other anthropologists or the public. But here you are, anthropological students still hearing about me. And this is uh, Stuart, who has a few things to say. Good morning. I'm Julian Stuart. I am more renowned than my colleagues here. <laughs> <laughs> my first research was in archaeology, and then I moved to ethnographies. And I worked with the Shoshone, the Pueblo, and later with the Carrier Indians in British Columbia. I found that cultures in similar environments tend to follow the same developmental sequences and formulate similar responses to their environmental challenges. I focus on the adaptation of individual cultures to specific environmental circumstances. I'm interested in large-scale cross-cultural analysis. I don't believe that these cultures follow a single universal sequence of development. I think that they evolve in any number of distinct patterns depending on environmental circumstances. The methodology that I outlined for this multilinear evolution involved a field of study that we now call cultural ecology. 
Cultural Ecology's examination of the cultural adaptations formulated by human beings to meet the changes posed by their environment. And that's our topic of discussion this afternoon. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for that presentation. I'm sure we got a lot out of it. Uh, you'll notice that the students discussed uh, three different individuals in their presentation on a cultural ecology or cultural materialism. Uh, one of them was George Peter Murdoch, who is uh, known for his founding, if you will, of the Human Relations Area Files, which for those of you in the Houston area, you can find an entire set of those files at Rice University's library. Uh, they usually have a, an individual librarian that's in charge of that collection though, so if one of you ever want to go look at it, I would suggest you make arrangements ahead of time in the sense that it is a very expensive uh, uh, item for that library to have procured and as such it has to be protected. Um, it represents an earlier time in anthropology, though, the accumulation of those files. And it represents a time when people felt that the appropriate goal of anthropologists and anthropology was to document in entirety all the world's cultures. And again, that goes back to earlier, I think, Boazian notions of cultural diversity, historical particularism. And they thought that the best way to document that was to set it up in the form of these human relations area files. The item, I guess, that would be added onto is, again, was this strong reliance upon the comparative framework. And it kind of, of um, anticipates uh, computer technology and way of thinking, meaning that if you wanted to, for example, know what the associated variables were, with a particular kind of sociocultural uh, dimension, say, we'll say a patrilineal uh, form of organization, that you trace your relatives or ancestry uh, through the males of your family. And that becomes an important 
organizing principle then of your society and culture. Well, then you could <laughs> poke in the uh, long rod that would go into the human relations area files, and you would uh, set that as your, that's the factor you want to look at, is, is patrilineality. Well, then upcoming would be, it would hit the hole, so to speak. This is an earlier form of computer technology when you had key cards, etc. Uh, upcoming then would be all those societies and culture among those 365 mentioned by our students uh, that would have patrilineality as one of its core features. Then you could look to see what the other features in that society and culture were that corresponded with patrilineality. So it wasn't just, say, a patrilineal hunting ban in the Plains Indians. It could also be patrilineal societies in Southeast Asia. It could be other examples of patrilineal societies in many different parts of the world. But you could see then what the associated patterns were that went along with or were interdependent with that particular aspect. If you're Recall, I'm using lots of adjectives here that go back to earlier lectures. Interdependency of elements, uh, seeing societies and cultures as systems, um, etc. And that is uh, where anthropological thought was in the uh, 40s and 50s, again, when the human relations area files were an important uh, emerging tool. Again, uh, largely encouraged by such people as George Peter Murdoch. He thought that he had come up with a list of variables that would be sufficient for all time and, and throughout the future studies of anthropology that, that one could take these various blocks, if you will, or areas of concern or descriptive areas of a society and culture, and then you would have a sufficient uh, template for cross-cultural comparison and discussion. Uh, so, for example, I mentioned patrilineality to you. Another one would be, let's look at the uh, institutions that are associated around uh, food and procuring of food or acquiring of food for nutrition. You could take nutrition as being the core variable that you wanted to look at, and then you could see in these 365 societies, the different kinds of foodstuffs that were involved, the kinds of technological innovations that were used to uh, create those foodstuffs or create the uh, ability to acquire those foodstuffs, etc. And, and in a way, I see that that kind of anticipates uh, computer um, interdependency, if you will, in terms of associating variables. And that's really what uh, George Peter Murdoch had in mind. Is uh, he didn't know about computers, and he certainly probably didn't have a personal computer of his own when he came up with these formulations because they didn't I yet exist. But in a way, I see that the human relations area files could have been viewed as a, a kind of awkward, if you will, a stepchild of computer technology, or better said, maybe computer um, ways of thinking. Because I, I think it's my conviction that technology does influence the way in which a particular society at any one time thinks. So again, I see George Peter Murdoch's contribution and work as uh, preliminary to or as anticipatory of uh, later work that would be done as a result of uh, computers. Notice in there that I did talk or mention something about templates. and. If you'll notice in, in more current anthropology, in today's anthropology, uh, people writing, say, in the areas of, again, postmodern kinds of concerns or, or interpretive anthropology or humanistic anthropology, uh, whatever uh, various formulations you want, uh, some of these templates are found to be unacceptable. And there was this kind of scheme that you divide society up into ecology, environment, uh, lineage or kinship organization, economic organization, political organization, and thereby you would then discover a range of variation that can occur in societies around the world. You would find that these are Western categories imposed outside or artificially on human societies, their study and their analysis. And, and while it seemed perfectly acceptable at that time to kind of take in uh, this Western kind of imposing of categories, it is uh, a point of contention around which today's scholars, I think, would, would take issue. And it would be a point of issue uh, that would uh, separate more current 
formulations of theories from past chapters in theoretical development and thinking in anthropology. Uh, another anthropologist that was uh, mentioned by this group, or very appropriately, uh, was um, uh, Leslie White. Leslie White I met here at, uh, at the University of Houston, uh, low many decades ago now, and when I was a young professor. And he was actually a visiting professor at Rice University, and he graciously accepted an invitation to give our students and faculty in the larger university a guest lecture. And he uh, was primarily known for his ecology or energy theory of cultural evolution. Um, some people have even called it energy evolution, but let's call it energy uh, theory of cultural evolution. <coughs> and again, his uh, main con contribution, I think, was to to uh, underscore or highlight or emphasize the overwhelming importance of the form of energy that was being utilized. In other words, again, it, it revolves around these traditional discussions in anthropological circles of hunting and gathering societies, agricultural societies, and industrial societies. And today we can add either atomic-based societies, although that's in great disfavor now, especially with recent events in Russia and, as, and in the, earlier in the United States, Three Mile Island, et cetera. Uh, uh, but also uh, my, my repeated emphasis upon computerization and electronic basis of social organization in societies. Uh, Stuart, or excuse me, uh, Leslie White would do very well now in terms of elaborating on his theory and adding this final chapter, or more recent chapter, it's certainly, we hope, not the final one, <laughs> or we are better run out and get a shelter somewhere. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's taking some of those notions and elaborating upon them uh, that gives him this energy theory of cultural evolution. In other words, he looks at the source of energy that people harness or utilize in order to be able to successfully adapt to a particular set of environmental constraints. In, in White's case, he paid less attention to cultural diversity. That's the major area around which he would be distinct from Julian Stewart and his formulations. And yet, uh, he would still be very similar to Stewart in the sense of that return to nomothetic concerns, to large-scale images of culture change that we might refer to as cultural evolution, not minor episodes in culture change that we might refer to as either culture change or acculturation or enculturation or uh, some of the assimilation, other forms of, of lesser uh, scale uh, examples of cultural um, development over time. And he would then focus, have us focus our eyes not only upon the major form of technology, but the kind of energy that was being utilized and the kinds of impacts it would have. And, and one of the, the major um, objections to this theory is also its major strength, as, as many times is the case. At the same time that he encourages us to focus our attention and our uh, concerns on energy, it is at the expense of any kind of elaboration on cultural diversity. So you kind of get this notion that environment is unimportant in his formulation and environmental concerns and environmental diversity have no effect or impact on the kind of cultural evolution that occurred. And that if you add the kind of energy that comes about from hunting and gathering, it would promote across the board in all different parts of this world, this planet Earth, wherever it was, whether it was an arid environment, whether it was a tropical environment, whatever, that all these areas of the world would be given the fact that they were reliant upon hunting and gathering as their source for utilizing energy in terms of adapting to the larger uh, uh, area in which they existed, that you would then have this uniformity of change or development occurring. So that when you add, say, agriculture to that, you would get wide-scale change going from uh, hunting and gathering 
to agriculturally based societies and cultures. And again, it's kind of an anti-Boazian point of view, if you will, because it takes away all those well-established concerns that Boaz had given us in terms of um, uh, cultural diversity and historical particularism, or a pluralistic conception of cultural history. Uh, and I find that when I reread and I look back at uh, these chapters in cultural theory, that there was more than just theoretical differences between Franz Boas and Leslie White. It takes on a, a kind of almost ugly tone, as it were, not in terms of their individual writings, but in terms of students' writings about the other camps' points of view. That makes me realize and led me to the realization that the, the controversy that existed between Franz Boas and Leslie White was more than theoretical. It was personal. And unfortunately, this is one of those chapters in anthropological history where that, that uh, takes shape and is given form. This kind of personal animosity is then raised to the level of theoretical discussion. But nonetheless, in spite of all that, uh, both uh, uh, Leslie White and uh, Franz Boas obviously were scholars in their own right. They each formed, as was uh, duly noted, uh, individual uh, departments of anthropology which were highly competitive with one another. If I could point historically to the two foremost departments of anthropology in the history of American anthropology, they would be the Department of Anthropology at the University of Michigan, which was formed, founded, and uh, developed by Leslie White, and the Department of Anthropology, which was founded, developed, and formed by uh, Franz Boas at Columbia University. And in turn, if you look at the scholars and the students that these two departments of anthropology produced, you would have the leading um, theoretical proponents of American anthropology that bring us to the present day. Um, so obviously, he's a highly important man, but his, uh, Leslie White, but his, his, uh, the extent of his contributions was focusing our attention more on energy and the form of technology that was involved. But again, he takes away this notion of environmental diversity and then a correspondingly a lesser concern with cultural diversity. Because for him, cultural diversity equated to technological diversity. Well, then the, the last person they named, of course, is the person or the individual with whom I started, which was Julian Stewart. And that's why I uh, put Julian Stewart in that pedigree or genealogy, if you will, of anthropological thinkers, because he retains the historical plurality or pluralistic conception of culture history given us by uh, Franz Boas. He retains the notion of configuration and pattern or nomothetic uh, concerns of culture change elaborated upon for us by um, Alfred Kroeber. And he gives it in his most fully formed uh, presentation known as cultural ecology. Um, cultural ecology is alive and well. It has its uh, detractors, it has its critics, uh, but it has more importantly than detractors and critics, it has its practitioners. And even today, if you were to do a, an important study of an archaeological nature again, or even of an ethnological nature, you would have to take into account those kinds of characteristics that Stewart focused on in his discussion of culture change and um, formulation. And those would be the environment, the technology, and the resulting change in social transformations that occurred. In other words, if you change the environment or if you change the technology, you would have corresponding changes in social transformation. And while Stewart also had this concern, say, that George Peter Murdoch did, in terms of a kind of a universe-wide, not universe-wide, planet-wide <laughs> uh, concern with uh, detailing uh, and documenting uh, the Earth's cultures, uh, human cultures throughout the world, um, he retained that, as, as did George Peter Murdoch. Uh, 
He didn't do it in quite the same fashion as George Peter Murdoch. Obviously, he didn't come up with human relations area files. He did draw attention to them. He did uh, concede that they were an important contribution and that they should be utilized in any formulation of large-scale um, conceptualization of culture change or cultural evolution. Um, well, all these theories, all these theoreticians are there for you to look at, to examine, to appreciate, to uh, see their contributions and their lasting impact on anthropology and the kind of, of students they, they encouraged. Um, as I said, uh, cultural ecology is important today. It has a, a lasting kind of importance, if you will. I've used it in my own work. Many people in our department use it. Uh, many of you have been exposed to it in uh, large uh, consideration. If you have any exposure at all to medical anthropology, biological anthropology, archaeology, some forms of ethnology, you have been versed to a certain degree then in cultural ecology. And it does have widespread significance today in terms of its contribution. Even if we were to suddenly switch our lights on to more humanistic anthropologists, such as Clifford Geertz, and interpretive anthropology, you would see that uh, he too retained some of these same concerns that his colleague, uh, Julian Stewart, elaborated upon. And while we sometimes see them as being in diverse or opposite camps or points of view, many times they, uh, a better uh, productive kind of uh, exercise might be done if we saw the ways in which they were similar to one another. Um, for example, Geertz did see the importance of looking at the ecology of a particular area, and along with Julian Stewart, or given him by Stewart, he would talk about the distribution of natural resources. But he kind of saw the ecology, the environment, the distribution of natural resources as kind of a backdrop in which cultural interactions or social interactions took place. So he didn't give it this uh, larger importance that Stewart did. But he certainly saw that it had its place and would probably emerge in the form of an introductory chapter or background chapter in any one of his uh, theoretical works or ethnographic works. Uh, as I'm sure in the future, when the students are presenting on Clifford Geertz and his contributions, they will make note of for us. Um, again, I just want to give you kind of a simplified version now of what this cultural ecology was all about, and how it was formulated, and how you might conceptualize it. If you can think, if you will, of a valley over here somewhere next to the university, that will be our little experiment in cultural ecology. I would say the first thing you would do is you would note the kinds of, of environmental uh, characteristics that you might give it. In this area, I think we normally think of our own uh, region as being somewhat semi-tropical. It's not tropical and it's not uh, temperate, but it's somewhere in between, and somehow that's been designated as semi-tropical. So in that semi-tropical environment, then, there are certain kinds of uh, natural plants that occur. You know, there are certain kinds of trees, certain kinds of foliage, certain kinds of crops that are more advantageous or grown in this region and have uh, a rightful place here than do others. Um, for example, Texas is a, is a, a, a culture area given over to the uh, development of cattle resources, the development of the oil industry, and cotton. Those are the three that I'm familiar with off the, off the top of my head anyway. And if we looked at this valley around, we would see that those forces would be present in terms of the ecological variables that exist. And then, if you will, we add people to this whole equation. And they would come into this valley, and they would sort themselves out according to the distribution of those resources. That, in turn, would create or set up certain kinds of social institutional arrangements, which would organize the people in productive organizational groupings. In turn, they would come later than to have or be associated with having certain kinds of ideological ways of thinking. We could call it religion, you can call it politics, you can call it whatever you want, but these are the, this is the stuff of which cultural variation is made in Stewart's framework and theory. You have these basic lower level uh, kinds of fundamental arrangements that are, that are in place that give rise or give the ability of particular human groups to adapt and come together in a particular 
uh, environment. So you have the environment, you have the technology, you have the social organization, and then you add to that final, finally the ideology or set of ideological concerns. And it's an ideology in those religious and political and areas of thinking in that way in which you have fundamental diversity occurring. So in Stewart's framework, you get the cultural diversity of cultural relativism, and yet you get the uh, nomothetic concerns of ecology, uh, environment, technology.